In this video, I'll be introducing categories and metacategories. These are very related topics, except they have very subtle differences, and I'll explain those differences in this video. Now, the idea behind category theory is that we're going to merge all of the topics I've talked before on this channel. It's a merging of everything before. So the things I'm going to merge, the series I'm going to merge, is abstract algebra, topology, manifolds, and even Euclidean geometry. You might think that some of these are quite different from each other, but they're actually very, very similar, and I'm going to show you how. And it's via category theory. Now the thing shared between all of these different topics is that they have structure. Now what do I mean by structure? Well, in abstract algebra, for instance, so for example, group structure. We have a group, G, and we have an operation, times. And that's the structure for abstract algebra. In topology, we have a set, X, and we have the topology, T. It's uh, The T here is the added structure onto X, and the multiplication here is the added structure onto G. And in manifolds, we have a lot more structure. So we have the set M, we have the topology T, and we have the atlas A. We have a smooth atlas. In Euclidean geometry, this is very simple, we have distance. So we have the Euclidean geometry space, which is just R2, and we have a distance function, which gives us the structure, except the distance function is usually you know, set in stone. But I'm just going to use that as the example. And you could also say that there's angle measurement. So I'll just write like a degree sign, right? So we have distance and angles. And that's the structure in Euclidean geometry. So we start off with a set, and then we add something else onto it. And that's what I mean by structure. And now another thing we have is structure-preserving maps in every single one. So for example, in abstract algebra, we have homomorphisms. This is a map, F, which takes you between two groups, G and, say, G prime. And it preserves the structure, preserves the structure in the way that F of G times H is equal to F of G times F of H. And that's how homomorphisms preserve the structure in groups. In topology, well, we have continuous maps. If I have a space X with a topology T, and into a space Y with a topology T prime, then a continuous map has it that every single open set in the output has a corresponding open set in the input. It preserves the notion of open sets, just as how a homomorphism preserves the idea of the operation. And in manifolds, we have, say, diffeomorphisms. So we have a function from M, T, it's an atlas, into N, T prime, another atlas. And then we have it that they are, it's smooth. So a smooth function between two smooth manifolds. In Euclidean geometry, we have, uh, we have rigid motions. We have, say, a transformation T, which takes you from R2 into R2. I'm not even going to bother writing the structure on this one. And we have that the distance between x and y is equal to the distance between Tx and Ty. It preserves, this map preserves the notion of distance. And so in Euclidean geometry, for instance, uh, if I have an equilateral triangle and I look at its image via a, a transformation, we have it that every single part of this triangle remains the same. It creates congruent triangles, this distance-preserving map. 
it this is the idea of congruence this triangle is congruent to this triangle via this structure preserving map so structure preserving maps gives us notions of how to transfer over structures obviously and then here's a property of structure preserving maps is that if i have a say a topological space x i have a continuous map f into another topological space y and i have another continuous map g which brings you into a topological space z well then the composition should remain the same so g composed f should also be continuous in order for this to be a valid structure preserving map this is also true for homomorphisms the composition of homomorphisms is a homomorphism and there's also the property that for every single say topological space the identity map is structure preserving so identity on x the identity map obviously is structure preserving because you know it stays the same it preserves the structures literally because it preserves everything so now the idea behind category theory is to take all of this all of these ideas smush it into one so what's the thing that separates all of these from being joined together well obviously it's the structures so under groups, you have the multiplication, and under topology, you have the topology, and under the manifolds, you have the topology and the atlas, and under the Euclidean geometry, you have distance. But what if we stripped these sets of defining the structures? So what if we just get rid of the structures, and instead, we focused our attention onto the maps and the sets? So we we just look at the map and the set and that's what we care about so here's what i mean if i have say a group g and i look at every single homomorphism f from g into g prime and i just look at all those homomorphisms let's say i don't know the operation on g all i know are the homomorphisms well then i could pretty accurately determine the operation on G only using those homomorphisms. The structure there, because it's structure preserving, I can tell you so many facts about G without actually knowing anything about the operation. And this is what happens in category theory, is that we remove the fact that we know the structure and we only look at the maps and the sets. So let's go ahead and define well, first, let's define a metacategory. Now, the reason why I'm calling this a metacategory will become clear in a few moments after I define it. Now, a metacategory is going to be something I'm going to call C, and it's going to have two properties. It's going to have, well, two things. It's going to have objects. So it's going to, there's going to be objects of the category, and the objects are going to be denoted by A, B, C, you know, those letters. And uh, it's also going to have arrows, which are, you will also hear, morphisms. So we have arrows or morphisms, which are going to be F, G, H. The objects are the sets. The arrows are the structure-preserving maps. So the objects could be topological spaces, and the arrows could be continuous maps. I don't know what they are. I'm removing the structure, and I'm just looking at the sets, which are the objects, and the structure-preserving maps, which are the arrows. And now the arrows actually have uh, some properties, which is that um, there are objects. For every single arrow, there are objects called the domain of the arrow and the co-domain of the arrow. And what we usually write is that F is a arrow from the domain of F into the co-domain of F. So really, instead of writing arrows just abstractly with their letter, we usually just write, say, F is an arrow from A to B. 
It's that simple. And this is the same notation we've been using for maps. That's why this notation really exemplifies the fact that we're working with structure preserving maps. And now, the other thing categories have, or meta categories have, is an operation, which is that for every arrow F and G, uh, such that the codomain of F is equal to the domain of G, there exists another arrow, H, which is equal to G composed F. And so we have this operation, G composed F, which is a map from the domain of F into the codomain of G. So let me draw this out. It's basically this diagram, but I'm just going to draw it out so you understand it. We start with the domain of F, and we take it via the arrow F into the codomain of F. And by this fact, this is the same as the domain of G. And then, of course, we take the domain of G to the codomain of G. Well, then, you see, via this diagram, we can draw, finish the triangle, and do G composed F. And that's what this is saying. It's saying that for two structure-preserving maps, the composition is also a structure-preserving map. This is what we talked about. It's this diagram. The next thing I have to talk about is the properties of this um, composition map. Now, ignore this. This is just a special bulleted point. It's not the composition map. Now, what it says is that uh, it's associative. F composed G composed H is equal to F composed quantity decomposed H. It's associative, and that's the property of composition. And now there's one more thing, is that for every object, A, within the category, there exists a, an arrow, or a morphism, there exists an arrow, 1A, which is from A to A. So it's a, an arrow that takes A to itself, such that, it's an identity under the composition map. So let me just write uh, for all F, which is from A into some other object, that F composed 1A is equal to F, and that for every other arrow, G, which is from some other object into A, that 1A composed G is just G. And so let me just reiterate what I'm talking about in a meta category. In a meta category, we remove the fact that we have to have a specific structure and that we have to have pairs and that we have to have so on and so forth, that we have to name the specific structure and we just look at the map and the objects. And then they have the properties that F, the arrows or morphisms are from one object into another, that they can be composed, and that there is an identity which is all the things we talked about over here. So that is what a meta category is. Now the thing about this is, and the reason why it's called a meta category is because I never mentioned sets in the definition. Of course, I kept relating it back to sets and I kept saying, ah, these are maps. But really, look at this definition. We just have the objects. I never said that the objects have to be sets. They're just objects. Never said that what they were. And the arrows, they don't have to be maps, they're just arrows. And they have two properties, that they have a domain and codomain. But this is very abstracted from the idea of sets and maps. This is disjoint from even that. So they don't even have to be maps or structure preserving maps. We've completely removed those notions. And we're just looking at them completely abstract. And more specifically, the collection of objects doesn't have to be a set, and the collection of morphisms also doesn't have to be a set. This is actually a good definition for what we wanted. Uh, that's because the collection of every single group is not a set. It's too big to be a set. So that's actually a good thing, that we don't require that the objects have to be a set. And the collection of all of the homomorphisms between groups is not going to be a set. So that's a good thing. Same thing with topological spaces. The set of all topological spaces is too large to be a set. But 
this definition doesn't need it to be a set. But sometimes it's useful to have the properties that it's a set. And so I'm going with definition two of just a normal category, which is that it's a meta category where the collections of objects and arrows are sets. Now I'm going to call the collection of objects ob c. So I'm just going to write it like that. And the collection of arrows, which I'll just call r of c, are, well, sets. And that is the distinction between metacategories and categories. And now there's actually things called functors, which are sort of like structure preserving maps between categories. And there's also things called natural transformations, which are sort of structure preserving maps between maps. And so we get so many different new things, new concepts that allow us to connect these in ways that we wouldn't be able to without category theory. And that's it.